So our next speaker, Renee Hutchins, is a professor at the University of Maryland. She's been up here already. You um, heard her interview, uh, Gary Drinkard. And Renee graduated from Yale Law School. She clerked on the Sixth Circuit for Judge Nathaniel Jones. <laughs> you said four sentences. Well, OK. Um, two more. Two more. Uh, she worked as a prosecutor both at the Department of Justice um, in, the, in the tax division, and also as a special assistant United States attorney in DC. And then she also worked as a defense lawyer at the Southern Center for Human Rights with Steve Bright. So she has a, a unique perspective. And she's going to talk to us today about, I'll get off, I promise. <laughs> Um, so good afternoon. So I have uh, uh, been tasked with trying to get us back on track. So I'm going to give you the 15 minute version of what was going to be a half hour talk. Um, so we have heard a lot today about Gideon's promise and about the ways in which we are failing that promise and about the human costs of that failure um, and about some responses to the failure. But what we haven't heard a lot about is the prosecutor's role. So what, what should the obligation of the prosecutor be in the face of, of ineffective assistance of counsel? When the prosecutor bears witness to ineffectiveness, does the prosecutor have an obligation to do anything? Um, does the obligation shift depend upon whether we're talking about the institution of the prosecutor's office or the individual prosecutor? Um, does it shift if we're talking about bearing witness at trial? or if we're talking about the, the, the observance of ineffectiveness in collateral attacks upon convictions. Um, so I, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about what the role of the prosecutor might be, and I'll be candid right up front. I'm gonna offer more questions than answers. Um, and I'd like to spend the 15 minutes or so that I have with you uh, doing a couple of things. First, I'm gonna tell you two stories, and then I am going to just offer my observations. Uh, the two stories come from practice. And the first is from my time as a federal prosecutor, and the second is more recent and involves my work with a state prosecutor's office in Baltimore City in connection with my defense work. Um, and the observations, like I said, are gonna be more questions than answers. So first, the story. So I, I the two stories. I, I have spent uh, about 80% of my life as a lawyer, um, as a defense attorney. Um, but for about three or four years back in the mid and late 90s, I worked as a federal prosecutor. I was at the Department of Justice as a, as a tax prosecutor. And we, at the time, Justice used to, Maine Justice used to send all of its baby prosecutors over to the US Attorney's Office to get some trial experience. Um, and the DC uh, US Attorney's Office is a lot like a, a state prosecutor's office because DC is a federal enclave. So we prosecuted all the standard street crime. I got a robbery case when I was at the prosecutor's office, and it was a run-of-the-mill robbery case. The, the victim had been standing at the metro station, kind of flipping through his wallet looking for his metro card, the public train system in DC. And he had been attacked from behind and shoved to the ground and hit his head either on the, the metro turnstile or on the ground and had sustained a, a superficial but a pretty serious injury to his forehead that required um, some stitches and some plastic surgery and all this kind of stuff. His wallet was taken and his assailant was arrested literally within steps of the robbery because there happened to be an undercover metro officer standing right there who chased the guy out of the metro station and up the stairs. Um, so I got the case and, and thought, eh, it's a pretty open and shut case. I don't know what the defense attorney did in preparation for the case because we had open file discovery at that point and that was handled completely by the paralegal. So I turned the file over and I have no idea if he ever came to sign up. But the day of trial, I met him and there were some pretty clear indications to me as a very young prosecutor, I was probably 28, um, that things were not what they should be with regard to this representation. So it seemed to me that the attorney was meeting his client for the first time on the day of trial. And this was a case where the guidelines were one to three and the maximum was five. So his client could actually do quite a bit of time. They appeared to be meeting each other for the first time the day of trial. Other things that signaled moderate warning flags for me as the prosecutor. Um, he waived a jury trial 
the client was entitled to a jury trial. He waived a jury trial in front of a judge that was a notoriously law and order judge, absolutely notoriously law and order judge. And he waived a jury trial at a time that it was the perception in our office that DC juries were defense friendly. I'm sure the folks at PDS have a different perspective on that, but we certainly felt that they were defense friendly juries. Um, he didn't, from what I could, I know he didn't, he didn't file any pretrial motions at all. None. He gave no opening argument. But the thing that he did that was most indicative to me of ineffectiveness is as the client was walking in, the client had managed to bond out four or five months after he was first arrested for the offense. And so he was out at the time of the trial. Client came in. He was talking to his lawyer. who was sitting in the courtroom waiting for the judge to take the bench. And the client is talking to his lawyer. And, and the, he shows him a note. And the lawyer goes, the client got up and he walked over to my victim who was sitting in the front row of the courtroom right behind my table and he handed him a note. The victim read the, and he went back and sat down. The victim read the note, he handed it to me. The note was my exhibit number one. The note said, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done it, I feel very badly. Put the victim on the stand and I'm showing you what's been marked, government's exhibit number one, can you tell me what that is? I can, what is it? It's a note, can you read it? We read it, who'd you get it from? Him. At the time of sentencing, we learned for the first time why the kid did what he did. And I say kid because he had just turned 18 before we indicted him. He was very young, he looked very young. And he told us at sentencing, not because his lawyer prepared him to, but because his lawyer turned and said, do you have anything you wanna say? And he stood up and he said, here's what happened. He had taken a girl out that he desperately wanted to impress. And he took her to the movies, and he took her to dinner, and he ran out of money. And he didn't have enough money to take her home on the train. And he was embarrassed. And he made a really stupid choice. And he decided instead of admitting to this girl that he really wanted to show what a great guy he was, Instead of admitting that he couldn't get her home, instead of figuring out another way for the two of them to get home, he decided to rob somebody. And so I stood up at sentencing feeling very magnanimous as the prosecutor after hearing this story. And the judge turned to me and said, Ms. McDonald, because I was Ms. McDonald at this point, Ms. McDonald, what do you want me to do? The guidelines are one to three. I'll give you the max if you ask for them. And I said, no, no, Your Honor, no. I, I, I'd like a suspended sentence. Give me two years suspended all. I need a GED requirement, I need some anger management. I felt very smug in what I had done because I was absolutely convinced that this kid was guilty. But as I moved past that experience, I got a lot less smug because it also seemed to me absolutely clear that if that kid had been represented by a different lawyer, he never would have picked up a felony conviction. If he had been represented by a different lawyer, he would have immediately been put in the diversionary system at the, at the US Attorney's Office. That was the kind of case it was. And so that case for me began to raise questions about what was my obligation as the prosecutor in that trial? I saw things that suggested to me that that representation was not an effective representation. Were there any huge warning signs? Perhaps the no. Beyond that, did I have anything else that was a huge signal to me that this was an effective, ineffective representation? I don't know that I did. Which brings me quickly to my second story. I am currently working as, uh, on the faculty at the University of Maryland. I run the Appellate and Post-Conviction Advocacy Clinic there. And one of my clients in that clinic is a kid named Mark Grant. I say kid because Mark was arrested when he was 13 for shooting another teenager in Baltimore City. He was 14 when he went to trial. He was 15 when he was sentenced to life for murder. I met Mark in 2007, he was 39. He had spent every day since the day he was 13 behind bars. We worked for six years to get Mark out of jail, six years. In March, we brought Mark home. We would not have been able to do that if it were not for the assistance of the state's attorney's office in Baltimore City. I went to the state's attorney's office in Baltimore City after I had worked up Mark's case. 
I showed them my witness statements. I showed them the brief that I would have filed. I showed them the evidence of ineffectiveness that I had developed. And they agreed not to oppose my commutation request. So I would like to think that Mark's release is a result of my brilliant lawyering. I would be lying to myself if I did that. There is no way Mark would be home today if the state's attorney's office had fought us tooth and nail over the evidence we had uncovered. Which brings me to my closing observations, hopefully on time. <laughs> what does this mean in terms of the role of the prosecutor when faced with ineffectiveness? Somebody said earlier that the crisis in indigent defense is not a defense problem, and that is absolutely true. It is not a defense problem. But the adversarial system makes it very difficult to figure out exactly what the role of the prosecutor is in confronting ineffective assistance. But it's something we have to think about because the crisis in indigent defense is not a defense problem. We have to think about the low-hanging fruit. Institutionally, in cases of clear ineffectiveness, it seems clear to me that prosecutors who have a constitutional duty to do justice, who have a duty to uphold the United States and states' constitutions, that in cases of clear ineffectiveness, prosecutors at a minimum have an obligation not to push back against defense requests for relief. At trial, we could perhaps get more creative. Perhaps prosecutors have a duty to make a record. Perhaps they have an obligation to report to a judge or to a supervisor in the defense office if they recognize, I'm not talking about strategic calls, I'm talking about clear instances of ineffectiveness. Perhaps they have a duty to ask for a continuance, to give somebody time to correct the problems that they are facing. I don't know that we know what the answers are, but I know that we have to think about what the answers might be because we are not going to fix this problem on the backs of defense attorneys. It seems to me at a minimum that we can say prosecutors have an obligation when they see a clear mistake to acknowledge that a mistake has been made, to acknowledge that justice has not been done, and to not stand in the way of correcting the error. So thank you for your time. Hopefully I was on time. <laughs>